have my co-host Cynthia Williams will take it from there. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Brown School's Open Classroom. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Cynthia D. Williams. I'm the Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships at the Brown School. It is a pleasure to be here with you, my friends and colleagues, Gary Parker, Janet Gillow, and our professor, Dr. Derek Brown, this afternoon. Before we launch into today's presentation, please allow me to elevate and recommend two upcoming webinars. On Monday, April the 19th, Tim McBride will be the presenter for the long and winding path to Medicaid expansion in Missouri. Are we there yet? And the following day, Tuesday, April the 20th, Chris Fry will present part one of two parts on your next move, the when, why, and what of the new retirement. Relevant to today's presentation, please feel free to put your questions in the chat which will be monitored and elevated later in the Q&A portion of this presentation. Unfortunately, we are not able to see or hear you or respond to raised hands. However, we will be diligent to elevate your questions to the presenter. The next voice you hear will be that of my friend and colleague, Gary Parker. He is the Associate Dean for External Affairs and the Director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute here at the Brown School. Take it away, Gary. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm so excited to be here with you today. It's an often that we get a chance to co-host together, so this is a treat for me. I want to welcome all of you and thank you again so much for joining us at Open Classroom. I am really looking forward to today's talk. It's titled Introduction to Economic Analysis for policy, which means that the folks, the, the participants, all of you who have joined us today are policy wonks, so I'm feeling like I'm with my people. I'm with my people and I'm so excited for that. And as I was sharing before we actually went live, I have never had the opportunity yet to hear Professor Brown speak. So I am so very, very, very enthusiastically excited uh, to hear him talk. Let me tell you just a little bit about him and then we will uh, hand it over. Derek Brown is an associate professor at the Brown School. His research focuses on cost, access to care, quality and disparities among Medicaid populations, including physician payment, housing instability and child maltreatment. He teaches courses in health economics and health policy in the Masters of Public Health program, as well as our Summer Institute. And in addition, Derek is a scholar in the Washington University Institute for Public Health and a faculty affiliate for the Center for Health Economic Policy and the Centene Center for Health Transformation and the Center for Violence and Injury Prevention. Sounds like you are really busy with all of those affiliations. Please uh, give a warm open welcome, uh, open classroom welcome to uh, Professor Derek Brown. Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thanks so much, Gary. Um, it's really my pleasure to uh, be here and um, to uh, be, I guess, speaking to a, a nice virtual audience. So um, of course I can't um, see you, uh, but yeah, look forward as, uh, as they said to uh, getting some questions and, and feedback um, <clears throat> from the chat. Uh, the talk should probably take about 35 minutes or so. So uh, we'll have, We'll have time at the end and um, would love to elaborate further. So let me go ahead and, and dive in. Um, again, thank you for, for joining. Um, so uh, I'm trained as an economist and um, kind of some of the content that you see here is how I feel like um, we uh, get to take some of the tools from this field and make it um, more relevant hopefully to social and, um, and social policy, social work um, and public health. So here's an outline uh, for the talk. Um, uh, I'm just gonna kind of continue ahead uh, full steam, but you'll see this roadmap periodically. Um, I wanna start by talking a little bit about just what we're covering, uh, why you might be interested in this um, and who the audience is here. And, um, who can do these kinds of studies. Um, hopefully we're reaching a general audience. Um, you might be a student, um, you might be currently in practice, um, whatever, um, that's good and, and we welcome all comers. All right, so um, 
what do we mean by, by economic analysis or, or economic evaluation for policy? Um, we mean a lot of different things. And uh, unfortunately, there's, there's not a standard or single definition. Um, sometimes uh, things are done at a very macro, um, say national large scale level. And sometimes uh, the same principles are applied at a, at a pretty small um, kind of localized, uh, say, agency or, or um, uh, 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 clinic level. And, um, and that's okay. Um, a lot of the same commonalities um, enter those things. We usually um, mean that we've got some kind of measure of costs or what it costs to do an activity. So our, our program, our policy, or intervention. Um, oftentimes, uh, this is done in partnership uh, with some kind of impact or uh, program evaluation. Uh, so that would be the second one here where I said a measure of effect. And um, sometimes, so occasionally, um, we are willing to kind of go an extra step further and attach some dollar values to those benefits. Uh, maybe they come direct in terms of financial savings, or maybe we have an estimate of them. Um, but that, that's an extra level of, of kind of um, both difficulty, uh, but also um, of uh, potential use of the results. So we're going to kind of step through those in, in the next few minutes. Um, <clears throat> so we're often doing this in tandem or partnership with another evaluation. Um, it might be done um, at a planning stage, maybe before any work actually happens. It might be done in the middle of... Um, of a program or part of maybe ongoing kind of efforts of your um, of your work, or maybe we're doing this afterwards. Um, so, for instance, Medicaid expansion. I've seen economic evaluations before forecasting what would happen, and now looking back after several years in, in different st states. All right. Um, so, why should you care about about doing this, and and what are some of the reasons that that might have brought you here today? Um, I think. Uh, when done well, and when we have enough data, uh, and we kind of take the time, um, hopefully economic evaluation is going to help us make uh, better decisions. So doing the work that you already want to do, um, we're already invested in social work, social policy, and public health. We have our particular areas of, of interest in work, um, but we all kind of deal with this problem of, of scarce resources. Um, it gets a little bit of a bad name, um, the way that economists are uh, a dismal science and we, you know, we're so focused on efficiency. Um, but I think it's true that um, there's never enough kind of to, to go around. And so if we can make uh, better decisions about <clears throat> how uh, identifying strategies or approaches um, to do our, our uh, mission or to meet those objectives, um, economic evaluation is, is a tool for that. Um, I've added a third one here, which I think is, is sometimes overlooked or actually seen as in uh, tension with the second. Um, so you may, you know, um, we've all probably heard of like an equity efficiency trade-off in economics. That's potentially there, um, but I see this um, increasingly as these tools can be used um, to help um, shed light on, on um, our, our growing interest and awareness in, in equity. Um, this will come up, I'll show in several different cases about um, distribution of costs, benefits, and effects. Um, and so I think um, if we do things carefully and we, we go a little deeper, um, it can really be um, a powerful tool here. Um, potentially, but certainly not guaranteed, you might be able to make some kind of business case for, for what you're doing in terms of social justice. Um, but don't assume that there's, um, that there's a tension. Um, there, there may be a, a relationship here. Lastly, uh, hopefully this is a, um, a way also um, for um, your agency, your organization, uh, your initiative to have some kind of internal accountability or at least respond to others um, such as funders who, who are demanding it. All right, so I know there's a nice um, diverse audience um, and that's terrific because um, I really feel like um, at a kind of fundamental level, um, these principles should be accessible to, to anyone, um, should be accessible to anyone who's going to take the time 
um, and is is willing to ask some of these um, these questions to gather the data and to to um, to do um, an impact evaluation. Um, you can do an economic evaluation too. Um, I think analysis certainly doesn't have to be sophisticated to be useful. If you pick up some academic journals and you look for really polished, sophisticated studies of, of large scale initiatives, sure, um, those might have been study teams that had several years to prepare those. And there's a place for that. But for most of us, um, for smaller efforts, um, we could do a lot um, at a at a um, at a, uh, at a simpler level and still get a lot of value out of this. And then lastly, I've bolded this, but I think it's really can't be overemphasized. Um, those who are doing the work, um, if you're, you're in the trenches or on the ground or whatever your analogy is there, uh, you have the best knowledge of what's relevant here. You know, the questions that, that should be asked, you know, what resources are being used, who's being affected. Um, if you bring in an outside consultant, um, if I just drop in on a, on a study um, and I don't have some help um, here, um, I'm not necessarily going to be able to do um, as good of a job. So um, you are part of, of that. Um, and you also are more likely to be attuned to um, specific distributional and equity or cultural differences. Okay, so that's kind of my foundation for this. Um, I want to go through some key concepts and then show you some different types of evaluation before we bring it back to um, a couple of takeaways. So um, we'll get technical here for just a couple of minutes. Um, one thing that's important when you're doing any kind of economic evaluation is to try to be clear about the perspective of the analysis. Um, so outside of economic evaluation, you might think of this as deciding who you want to reach with your report, who is, um, who and kind of what is at stake here. Um, so another way to put this sometimes is, is what's your research question if, if this is a, a research type study. So who are you trying to speak to with this work? Um, whose resources are at stake? And as a result, when you um, clarify this and specify this, that's going to lead you through kind of these middle set of, of bullet points here. And that is, you basically need to decide whose costs and whose benefits are going to be counted. If you pick up a textbook on economic evaluation, um, they're typically going to be uh, focused on this bottom point here, which is uh, the societal perspective which is adding everyone together for, for the most, the kind of broadest analysis. And certainly that does make sense and is where some of the um, uh, kind of the most powerful uh, implications can be drawn, um, but we don't have to do that. Um, as I've indicated here in terms of some of these other bullet points, um, it is completely fine and uh, perhaps more relevant in a lot of cases um, to be just conducting analysis from, say, kind of a cash flow perspective of your agency. Um, you're the provider, you're the clinic, um, you are, have a, a relatively narrow mission. And even though there might be other societal resources that are at stake, it should be part of that societal perspective. It's not necessarily relevant to, you know, responding to your manager, um, responding to your board of directors. Uh, so being clear about this, kind of where you're going to draw these bounds uh, is important. And then a little bit apart from perspective, um, but I think is something you want to anticipate at this stage is to also think about once I've kind of drawn these bounds, am I just going to add everyone up within this? Or do we have different groups, um, some, some distribution and, and equity concerns that we want to build in from the beginning? And I put this right here because you're going to need to anticipate this um, in terms of basically um, gathering those costs, gathering those effects or impacts, um, and, and attaching those values. So I'll keep coming back to that. Um, that is more data intensive. So sometimes we want to do that, and we can't do it, or we can't do it to, to the fullest. Um, but you want to anticipate that at the beginning. OK, so that's perspective. 
Uh, what do we mean by cost? I've, I've thrown out this word a few times uh, already. Um, certainly it can uh, and maybe often does refer to just, just the cash flow um, and expenditures. Um, but um, as this entry starts out here, and this is a little more of the textbook definition, um, the economist will think of cost as the value of all resources that are being used. And as I've said, this is whether purchased or not. So at, if taking a societal perspective, and let's say you have volunteers, um, you've got participants that have to take some time to engage in the activity, um, you've got donated resources, all those things should go together. Um, and the reason for that is, is this economics idea of opportunity costs. If they weren't being used here, uh, or if they are being used in this activity, um, they're not available for some alternate activity. Typically, um, cost, I think for a lot of the kind of the domains of social policy and public health, uh, personnel or labor costs, staff costs are perhaps uh, often our biggest. Um, sometimes, depending on what it is, uh, there might be other supplies and materials, of course. Um, so that's just going to depend on the problem. And then certain things, if we're let's say doing costing of, of a program that's, that's maybe only one quarter of, of uh, kind of like a, a department or a program's um, uh, efforts, then we may have shared items in which we have to apportion. Um, so those would be like overhead expenditures. Okay, so you wanna add all those up if you're taking a societal perspective. Now, um, I just got done saying in terms of perspective, sometimes, if it's my board of directors, my boss, uh, the accountant, um, sometimes uh, naturally you're looking a little more to balance the books. And so a cash flow perspective may be all that your audience is concerned about. Um, I'm okay with that. And you can certainly use these, these principles in that case. Um, you do probably wanna include a note somewhere in your reporting um, that your perspective is, is narrowed and might be omitting some of these other things. Okay, uh, before we move on from cost, um, there's, another, there's another term that, that you might see if you start picking up some reports or digging into other resources. And that's a notion of direct or indirect costs or direct and indirect benefits. Um, I think the simplest way to think of this is things that are sort of clearly tied to the activity. So oftentimes short term, um, those would be direct costs. Uh, for example, wages of anyone that's um, uh, actually carrying out the, the initiative that you're studying. Um, indirect costs or indirect benefits are tend to be intentional, uh, unintentional, excuse me. Uh, oftentimes they're longer term. Um, sometimes they're harder to measure. Um, we don't necessarily know if they're smaller or larger. Um, that's really going to depend greatly. Um, but sometimes uh, we, we will decide maybe to, maybe to exclude those if, if they're not readily available. Okay, so we've got some concepts around cost together. Um, what about sort of the other side of this, which is just what we're doing? Okay, effect or impact? Well, this is simply uh, going to be what is your, your program, your activity, your policy, or, or your initiative trying to achieve. So it's highly specific to the application. Um, that is really kind of going to be what are we seeking to do or what's, what's the objective of, of our work. Um, in terms of what we're measuring, uh, oftentimes we're looking for good things. So say improvements in, in certain social outcomes, um, but remember that good things can off also be, especially in a, in a health context, um, avoiding bads. So reducing hospitalizations or reducing medical costs. Um, so those are, are some typical ones. Um, you can also, as I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, report evaluations of, of process measures and intermediate outcomes. So we may have our goal on something out here, um, but we've got some metrics along the way that we're tracking. Um, you can certainly conduct uh, economic evaluations of those as well. All right, so benefit. Benefit in economic evaluation generally means the dollar value 
of an effect or impact. So it's attaching a price tag or a value to what you've got in this first row here with the effect. Um, sometimes that's built in. Um, if we were talking about those, say, avoided medical costs or emergency admissions, um, we just look for changes in those things. Um, some things uh, we don't necessarily have direct values of, um, and that can get kind of tricky. Um, there are some strategies for that, but at some point you might have to call in an expert to help a little more there. Um, uh, you can try to proxy those and we can try to estimate those. That's of academic interest. But I just want to say many important outcomes don't have straightforward dollar values. And I think that's okay. As neat as cost benefit analysis is, I think sometimes it might be more effective and simpler just to report those things in context. I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Um, but I think the important thing is don't feel like you necessarily have to value it all. There might be really important things that you're already uh, metrics and objectives that you're already going to report. Um, continue to do that and put the economic analysis, even if it maybe is a little more limited, alongside that. So think of them as, as complements, um, not necessarily as, as substitutes. Okay, so those are some concepts then that I'm going to put to use here in, in the next few slides, showing you some examples um, a couple kind of um, based on a true story um, evaluations and uh, some examples of, of how they might fit together. So the first one um, I would consider a, a cost study or a, a cost analysis. And this is uh, pretty simple in terms of, of its scope. Um, we're not doing anything with the effect or with the benefit side yet. We're just trying to value, assess and value what those resources were and possibly um, look at some patterns or, or some breakdowns for that resource use. Um, perspective is critical, like it always is. So being careful um, about kind of who's or what, what costs are being counted. Um, it may feel largely descriptive at this point, but it can still be really important. And um, in many cases, um, for certain kinds of problems, a detailed cost assessment has never been done before. Um, you might know that um, for, for what your objective is, um, that your budget um, is incomplete and really doesn't capture a lot of the resources that are being used. So actually doing a cost analysis um, is gonna take a good bit of effort um, and advance our understanding. Depending on what it is, you might be able to do comparisons of different approaches. Um, and if you gather data or it's relevant to your problem, um, you, can, you can start to look at those equity or distributional concerns. So costs are being shared proportionately or disproportionately. Um, why, how is that the case and, and why? Um, okay, so a, a quick, um, example um, in kind of our, our last national pandemic, uh, which uh, fortunately was, was mild in comparison to, to COVID was the H1N1 influenza uh, in, in 2008, 2009. Um, public health was very concerned about this. Um, so CDC did a lot of emergency uh, federal spending at that time. Um, to try to send out quite a bit of uh, vaccines and also supplies um, and, and support. And this was done in kind of our classic um, uh, block grant type um, sense in, in the US in that a lot of funds were sent out, um, but uh, different, different localities and states could do things differently. Um, because this uh, was expected to affect children more than um, older adults, schools were seen as a really key place where we could do some vaccination. And um, uh, it was kind of decided in advance we were going to do this school located vaccination, but nobody really knew what it would cost. So the bills were written, uh, Congress got on this problem, and money flowed out very quickly, but we didn't know what was going to happen in terms of resource use after that. So fortunately, um, there was evaluation done. 
Um, I'm going to keep referring to this problem a little bit, um, but they did find actually quite a bit of variation in costs and some states that you might consider um, kind of success stories um, relative to others in terms of how they ended up implementing their uh, vaccination. So in that case, um, we were studying a little bit after the fact, a few months after the fact, and going back and, and collecting some historic data. Okay, so that's a cost analysis. Um, what if we go ahead and add a little bit more to that? So we combine that kind of impact or program evaluation. That would be considered a cost effectiveness analysis. And, you know, in, in kind of plain language, you can think of that as what's our bang for the buck? So we know what these costs are what are we getting back? Um, it's, it's used to assess efficiency and it's, it's typically the, the dollars per outcome of interest. Um, we just divide those two things. Um, we've got dollars costs and then we've got some, some effect number and we're just, um, we divide those up. How much did it cost on average to achieve something? Um, for good and for bad under cost effectiveness, um, uh, the effects are, are anything of interest and they tend to be natural units for the problem. Uh, that's kind of um, helpful in some ways, uh, but it also limits comparability um, to, to probably similar things. Um, okay, so think about this a little bit in terms of the vaccination example I gave um, a moment ago in terms of school located vaccination. Um, now, if we had already done the cost study, I, I didn't show you the, the kind of the final numbers there, but if we had those numbers and then we had some numbers of vaccines that were administered, we could divide that, that total cost by the number of effect, whatever that is, and, and compute this average ratio. So here's two numbers um, pretty close actually to the actual ones that came out of this study. Uh, one. $8.50 per child vaccinated. Um, another way to think of that would be per dose administered on average. You could certainly compare that kind of number today to uh, what it might cost in terms of vaccinating for, against COVID. Um, and then combined with some epidemiological information, um, we had a, a cost effectiveness analysis showing not quite $6,000 per case averted. Now, as I've indicated here, results are relative to an alternative. In this case, it was basically relative to doing uh, no effort, uh, but you could also compare this to other strategies, um, such as, as public health clinics, and do a little bit more math to, to kind of facilitate that comparison. One thing I want to mention before I, I click on to the next one is um, uh, cost effectiveness. Um, so it's kind of built in when you add these costs if you're already doing some kind of impact evaluation. Um, so um, it's, it's combining that costing study with that. Usually we get a number back though that's, that doesn't have anything to do with the scale. So when you see these two numbers I have bolded here, um, that's what it costs kind of per case or per child. And we don't, I, we don't have any information here or out of a typical study about kind of the, the scope of this. So, so that's another potential limitation here. This might not be scalable. Um, that's kind of outside this, this analysis. All right, cost benefit analysis. Uh, CBA or BCA, <clears throat> that's the same thing. Um, I think many of us have kind of an intuitive sense of, of what this is. Um, and it's really asking that question, is it worth it? So you're taking the cost effectiveness from the previous uh, slide and now saying not just here's a case or a dose, uh, a, a dose administered or a case prevented, but actually going that next level of attaching some value, maybe some financial savings associated with that. Okay, so now if you think of this as a, as a kind of a fraction um, where you're dividing uh, costs by an effect, now you don't just have dollar signs in the numerator for the cost, you've got dollar signs in your denominator for the effect at value. We can report this two different ways. So if you do that um, at fraction, that's a, that's a ratio. So your total benefits in dollars divided by your total costs. Um, naturally, because um, um, if you're dividing benefits by costs, 
um, you're looking for a, a higher ratio, um, which would reflect um, kind of greater returns. Um, academics like to report this a little differently, which is as the net. Um, so that's our, our total benefits in dollars minus our total costs, where we're looking for um, something greater than zero. If we've got something less than zero, um, that's, that's not good news, um, at least in terms of the cash flow. Um, if there's other benefits that I think are out of this, it might be acceptable. But if this is our sole metric, um, then you don't want to see that. Okay, why would you want to report the net? Well, that's simply because I mentioned the problem of scale kind of missing earlier. The scale is captured in the net. So a big project will show uh, larger potential benefits and larger potential costs. When you do things as a ratio, you, you miss that, that scale. Okay, um, you can and should, as I'm gonna show in a minute, equity and, and distributional um, issues here too. Um, I'll introduce that on the next slide. So if we were to continue um, the vaccination example for a minute, take all that same data that we had before, but now just multiply it up really to scale. So 5 million kids at 850 a child um, would be a cost of $42.5 million. Now let's say that we prevent, um, our epi, epidemiological study showed that we prevented 5,000 cases. And we knew that on average, um, those cases cost society about $10,000 in terms of medical care, um, lost work time and productivity and so forth. So that'd be a $50 million benefit. Obviously 50 is greater than 42.5. So we're net better off by this framework of 7.5 um, uh, million, uh, slight typo there. And then the benefit cost ratio would be dividing that, that benefit by the, the cost. And again, that gives us a um, kind of a scale measure there of, of 1.18 that we could compare to other strategies. Okay, um, an organizational level. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this a little bit quickly, um, but take out the words societal from the previous slide. And um, I was saying that you could do things at, at more of a, um, a kind of a narrower perspective. Um, that's totally fine. So maybe it's just your organization's cash flow um, and the, the benefits are, are part of your, your mission. Um, that's okay. Like you're not gonna use this narrower perspective maybe to make large scale federal policy, but you can still demonstrate value to, to your constituents. So for example, uh, really switching gears here now for a minute, suppose that um, I work somewhere where we provide housing assistance to people with severe mental illness. And we're already reporting kind of every year, tracking and reporting in our annual reports, um, two key metrics, number of people who are rehoused and number of people connected to mental health care. So we see that as our objectives. It's not saving money that's our objective per se. Um, what we're trying to do is, is meet the needs of, of our clients and people with severe mental illness. Okay, so nothing that I report here is necessarily gonna change how work is done, but I'm trying to um, give something back to my, my stakeholders and to help put these results in context. Okay, so what do I do? I do a separate cost analysis um, and I decide that, uh, or I determine that um, uh, it's $800,000 for us to serve 400 clients per year. And I've also put a little note here, which would be if this was societal, um, we've got an additional 200,000 in donated services. I'm not gonna count those right now, um, but we would want to if we were doing a, a societal perspective. But I'm pretty confident I can get those on a regular basis, so we're, we're not going to count that for cost um, for this, this cash flow perspective. Okay, well, obviously, if you divide that 800,000 by 400, um, the simple cash cost per client serve would be $2,000. Um, if elsewhere you've estimated per capita benefits, uh, maybe to kind of the, the community, the city, and the county are, are $3,000 per year on average um, in terms of. Uh, mental health savings, um, the, the value of st stable housing, um, then you could say uh, we estimate an average benefit then of, of 3,000 and, and a total benefit of 1.2 million. Okay, 
So you've got some net numbers that you could report, return on investment that you could report. Um, if you were to include those donated services, it looks smaller, um, but um, you don't necessarily have to do that. So maybe you would want to report both of those things side by side. Okay, so those are the basic principles. Um, I want to go um, just a little bit deeper and point out kind of where equity and distribution can um, enter and, and also can be um, obscured, perhaps unintentionally um, or, or uh, hopefully not uh, maliciously, but it comes in. Okay, so um, suppose uh, in another different example that a community is proposing building a landfill. Um, the town is paying $20 million per year uh, in terms of its refuse costs, and the city manager um, uh, comes up with a proposal and says, we can do a lot better. We can um, spend $40 million for land to, to do our own landfill, um, and this project's going to pay off in three years. It's going to cost us $5 million to operate it, and we're going to be in the black uh, by the time we get to year three. So I put in some numbers here. Um, okay. Sounds good, maybe, <laughs> if you're the mayor or if you're the uh, town council, um, until you look a little deeper and you start to think about where this is coming from and, and who's affected. By the way, the perspective here, I think, would generally be the perspective of the town. So probably would not be looking at the surrounding community. You'd be looking at what was ever the jurisdiction of um, the, the, the um, the, the residents. Okay, so looking more closely, let's say we uncover several facts uh, that should be in your cost benefit analysis. Um, that $40 million uh, uh, for land that made this project look uh, feasible and have a quick payoff um, is coming about because the land is in a, a low income neighborhood with lower property values. Um, in addition, there are some indirect costs uh, estimated to be $5 million a year in terms of environmental health. And we know those are gonna be concentrated in adjacent neighborhood. Um, you can go back to the numbers in the previous slide and try to kind of play around. Um, you'll still find that the net benefits for the town, if we add all of these together, are going to be positive. So the simple recommendation wouldn't necessarily change, but if you were to divide things up distributionally, clearly some would be much worse off. And which ones are going to be worse off? It's gonna be that surrounding low income neighborhood. Okay, so furthermore, if we ignore this, just using kind of a naive application would essentially worsen the inequality that's already there. Even though it's net positive by a, a simple cost benefit uh, decision criteria, it's gonna worsen inequality. So do we stop right there? We might decide to stop right there. This is gonna get us a bit outside the tools, but there's some other ways that we could go through this a little bit. Um, you still might decide to recommend the project, but use the cost benefit analysis uh, by having at least two or more groups um, to show these distributional effects. Um, you could go through there and at least say, in dollar values, what kind of offsetting adjustments, homeowner credits and other things would be necessary um, to make um, all people uh, better off in, in dollar terms. And you might have to do additional compensations to kind of average those out across the groups. Okay, whether or not that actually happens really gets outside these tools at this point. Um, but I think when there are concentrated effects like this, which is the reality in a lot of cases, both the cost side and the benefit side are not equally distributed. Um, you have a duty to report that. You've got a duty to ask those questions. Okay, um, so those are the concepts and some examples. I wanna give kind of a couple uh, parting remarks um, and then open up for, for questions. Um, data, where do you go to get some of this? Well, if it's, Something that you're doing uh, retrospectively, so a, a post-evaluation, that's probably a little easier. Um, you've got your hands on more pieces of information. If you're doing a forecasting in advance, 
that's going to be a little harder. And so as a result, you're probably going to have a kind of bigger degree of uncertainty or, or potential margin of error. Hopefully the effects or impacts are something that you're already measuring. Um, and if not, you can, you can partner with an evaluation team. Uh, for cost data, you're often going to go to expense records, maybe do some key informant interviews, um, get timesheets and diaries from your staff, um, things like that, and dig deeper for, um, for shared resources. Um, communication tips. Um, you want to report your main findings as a base case, um, knowing that there may be a number of assumptions that you had to make, which could alter this and could alter the generalizability. Um, you always want to report the perspective of your analysis, um, and you want to specify the, the timing and, and the scope of the work. So um, I'm not going to talk through the box on the right, but that's just kind of illustrating some of, some of these things. Um, you want to include or do a sensitivity analysis, um, which I'll discuss in a moment. And you want to be honest about limitations and what's included and excluded. So I think you want to be transparent. Um, you want to, um, yeah, you want to be transparent and not necessarily oversell um, your findings. So if it's a cost effectiveness study, um, it's not going to reflect scale. Um, cost and cost benefit studies will. Uh, what do I mean by sensitivity analysis? Typically, we've had to make several assumptions along the way. So I would um, tell you um, for any of those uh, parameters, any of those estimates that are being used, um, you like to have a range. Um, sometimes we don't have, or I would say often we don't have statistical ranges formally, but we've got some kind of low high thing. You can recompute those in a series of different ways, um, do your analysis again to do what we think of as a, as a best case and a worst case. So it's probably a minimum or maximum. Um, sometimes it might be most likely or least likely if you've got some idea, um, but you want to vary those assumptions and recompute. Um, if things are uh, pretty stable, um, then, then that's fantastic and, and you can show a range. Um, if they're highly sensitive to small adjustments, then you want to probably attach a, a bigger caveat to your findings. Okay, um, so kind of wrapping up here, a couple of things uh, to, to maybe be careful of, either as a reader um, or a, a consumer, um, or in terms of your own work. Um, I have label these as, as false precision. So we have principles, but this isn't an exact science. So be open about limitations. Um, if someone happens to report down to the figures of, of uh, cents and you know it's, it's $3.74 as the per capita result, that's okay. But just know that that is going to have some kind of, of likely bounds around that. Um, so don't, don't overpromise in that regard. Double counting. Um, the notion of, of spillovers, if there are things that might be shared or one group, um, activities of one group affects another, um, you have to be a little careful here. Um, costs and benefits should only appear once. So my takeaway on this is if in doubt, leave it out, but acknowledge this in your limitations. Um, that's probably a, a safer strategy to, to be careful. Um, undercounting, uh, this would probably really be errors of omission um, that you can avoid through good attention to detail and talking to the experts. Like I said, um, it's, it's those who are actually doing the work. Um, ignoring distribution and equity, uh, this is huge. And I think you have to be vigilant for this. Um, a lot of what we do in terms of valuing benefits relies on economic principles that might reflect in ability to pay and structural equities, not true value. Okay, so be careful about this. Um, don't necessarily throw out the whole principles, um, but know about the issues and ask for these distributional effects. If you can't, it needs to be acknowledged as a significant potential limitation. Okay, and lastly, not doing evaluation at all. Um, I think doing some work really is important um, to help with 
decision making with finite resources. Okay, so I'm going to leave this kind of for uh, the future and wrap up. Uh, but there's a lot of great public resources. Um, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Derek. That was really informative. You know, I've always heard from students how much they enjoy being in your class, and you certainly did not disappoint today. So I, I thank you for your time and for this incredible insight. And we do have a bunch of questions that have come up in the chat that Cynthia and I have been moderating. And I also want to let folks know uh, that it's not too late to continue to submit your questions. So feel uh, free. And we're going to uh, jump right in with a question from uh, one of our colleagues, Kim Johnson, who's asking, are there some ethical guidelines around cost benefit analysis in terms of what type of CBAs are appropriate? Um, are there ethical guidelines? Yeah, <laughs> that's a tricky one. It's actually um, it's come up a little bit in discussion with my students right now. Um, this semester about say um, uh, COVID vaccination about about what do we do say you know even a, a COVID vaccination um, with um, uh, the Johnson and, and the pause on Johnson and Johnson vaccination right now you can imagine policymakers essentially doing a cost benefit analysis of sorts um, so uh, to me. I think um, there aren't firm guidelines there. Um, uh, one thing I would say is that the tools tend to be most valuable um, when used in kind of a, um, uh, in terms of the benefit side, uh, when used in kind of an, an abstract uh, sense. So we have this notion in economics of, of value of a statistical life. So that's a death prevented. Um, I would never pretend to say that um, this is the number that should be attached to Gary Parker or to Derek Brown or to someone else in particular. Um, that's not what we're doing when we talk about something like a, a speed limit regulation and looking at, at trade-offs there. So um, I think it depends on your comfort a little. I think you can do best um, in terms of uh, Kind of keeping audiences at the cost and the cost effectiveness level, you're probably on the most solid grounds. Things get a little more potentially controversial uh, when you do cost benefit. So, um, uh, cost benefit in in health and social policy, um, yeah, at times that might get us to to questions that we're just not fully comfortable with. And uh, our friend Alyssa is asking, uh, is there a type of analysis or reporting method that is typically better for certain topics than others? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, <clears throat> I didn't really remark on that. In um, health and healthcare, um, you will see widespread use of, of cost effectiveness. You'll see very little use of, of cost benefit. Um, and that is probably because of this um, this notion of trying to, to put the dollar value on, on health. Um, now, it really kind of depends how, how big and, and broad you want to be. Um, I can guarantee you that there are a number of, of health insurance companies um, that say do want to look at, at financial cost savings. Um, and they can do that just by kind of looking at, at changes in their, their insurance uh, patterns. Uh, but cost effectiveness is is a core topic um, in healthcare. Um, uh, cost benefit, I think, originated you know more in this this um, type of uh, say infrastructure world a little bit with transportation um, and, um, and and big public projects like that. Um, but it is it is still growing in in areas like environmental and and social, uh, social policy. Let me ask you this too, because we're, you know there is a lot of conversation right now kind of in the public realm about cost benefit, particularly as we try to climb out of this kind of economic depression that we've experienced as a result of COVID. 
and there has been a lot of federal policy aimed on helping to lift up the economy and deciding where those resources should go, you know, are always attached to a lot of analysis. But, but to narrow it down more specifically to Missouri, you know, because we have a, an, an, interesting, um, uh, uh, an interesting case study here where we have, where the voters have voted to expand Medicaid, that there have been um, reports uh, by, you know, Dr. Tim McBride of the Center uh, for Health Economics and Policies and others that have done the cost benefit analysis and have demonstrated that the cost to the state would be either neutral or would have some sort of cost benefit of, uh, you know, I think it was up to $39 million in the first year. How do you balance this um, wanting to, you know, put forth a uh, analysis against a political ideology that may not necessarily be interested in the actual analysis and will move counter to what the data may say? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a tricky one, Gary. I think, um, a um, couple kind of re reactions there. So, so um, uh, one is I, I think the core foundations in, in economics really kind of lead someone with, with my training to want to do cost benefit analysis and to, to find these these net improvements and and the larger net improvements over the, the smaller ones. So. Med Medicaid expansion may fit well into that, and and you know I I think the studies have added a lot of value. Um, unfortunately, I think we in in terms of kind of actual implementation and 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 politics and culture, we probably are going to spend more time fighting on what are those those benefits. Um, I don't know how transparent folks will always be about kind of who gets the benefits, but that's a distributional question of, of relevance too, um, whether or not somebody wants to, to acknowledge it. I think if you don't want to acknowledge that and you're trying to be a political opponent, you might just kind of be tempted to, you know, come up with some perhaps non-scientific explanation of, of why you don't believe in in the benefits um in defense of some of this this work and and to try to rescue it a little bit uh, on the cost side i think um there tends to be a lot less uh argumentation and and a bit less um politics um it will depend on on the topic but um everyone kind of knows when resources are being used and uh, we tend to have a fairly good, I think, shared understanding of, of how we can, we can track those down. So it may be that um, for actual, you know, kind of large scale, you know, regional, state, or national decisions, we don't actually get to use CBA to guide us to the final decision. But we can kind of use some of these pieces to lead us there and then um, appeal a little more to, to our principles of, of um, social justice and, and equity that we would often do um, as, as a way to conceptualize the findings. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, um, and, uh, and we should be willing to do that. I, I mean, I, I should share that I have found that my interactions with the you know, health department on the state level have been mostly positive, that they're interested in this data, that they want to hear, and that it's often sometimes the politics that get in the way of good policy. Um, so it's, it's trying to find a way to connect with the right kind of you know, internal bureaucrats who are willing to put forth the idea and and support it and just hope that you know public opinion or ideology doesn't you know derail positive policy making. We have another great question here from our friend Jen Rose, who's over at the Social Policy Institute, who wants me to first thank you for your presentation, and uh, 
Uh, she says, you mentioned that people, uh, quote, on the ground often have the best knowledge, yet they may not always have experience of training in these kinds of uh, economic analyses. Do you know of any tools or organizations that may help community-based organizations or advocates build capacity in this area? Hmm. Well, coincidentally, <laughs> I guess with the resources slide up here, I actually think these first uh, two um, bullets um, are, are some of the best ones that are kind of easily accessible, I think, to, um, to, to most folks. You don't have to have any real training in economics or accounting to, um, to get through those. Um, that would develop some of the content that, um, that I have here and, and, and just enrich it for you. Um, I, I do firmly believe in that, in that um, you, you can be an expert in, in the methods per se, but you have to, you have to know what's, what's being measured, or, or I mean, you have to know what to measure. Um, you have to know about these, uh, you know, the potential distributional issues, um, and you have to know who's, who's going to use these results and, and how. And, only kind of those, I think, doing the work or, or actually interacting, say, like you said, Gary, with, with some of the state legislators um, or your funders, your clients, those are the ones who, who can, can make this um, most relevant. So I think there's, um, you know, I would start with these resources. I think um, there probably are some other um, uh, organizations out there um, I, I, CDC has a lot um, in terms of health. Um, not quite sure as much in, on uh, on social policy. We we have just a few minutes, Derek, and I, so I wanna I wanna offer you an opportunity to share some parting thoughts and uh, and and any other kind of information off the top of your head with our with our participants today. Um. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I've enjoyed it and enjoyed the questions. Um, I guess I, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't maybe, uh, I had forgotten about the, the takeaway here. Um, I think um, it's, I, I would say um, uh, my, my two biggest takeaways would be, um, or, or three would be, um, it, it is worth it to, to try to do something. So I think don't, don't kind of be scared. I think doing some evaluation um, is, is really helpful. Um, second is the notion of, of cost benefit effectively, but I think economic evaluation in general has been seen as this tension with, with equity and um, distribution. I don't think it has to be. I think you can use it um, as a way to enlighten um, and, and enrich um, the, uh, the, the, the problem analysis. Uh, may not want to be the only tool you use to make the decision, uh, but we can use it to make, to make better decisions. Um, so that would be the last one, would be don't be afraid to engage, but also be humble at some point and, and understand that everything has limits. Thank you so much, Derek. There are all kinds of thank yous that are popping up in the chat. If you're interested in diving a little deeper with Dr. Brown, he will be teaching a summer institute course. It's a week-long course, three hours uh, a day for five days. I'm gonna put a link in the chat. If you're interested in uh, uh, considering joining that, I know he would love to have you. Uh, I also wanna share with you, Derek, that a number of folks have said that this has been the, the best open classroom that they have yet uh, attended. So that, and we've had some great programming here. So that is some, some high praise indeed. So, so thank you, uh, Derek, and thank you, Cynthia Williams. Thank you, Janet Gillow, and everyone that's working behind the scenes uh, to help us put together this open classroom. We hope to see you real soon, same bad time, same bad channel, uh, right here at Brown School's Open Classroom. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.